Eric Fromm says the vast majority of people in our culture are well adjusted because they've given up the battle for independence sooner and more radically than the neurotic person. They have accepted the judgment of the majority so completely that they have been spared the sharp pain of conflict which the neurotic person goes through. While they're healthy from the standpoint of adjustment, they are more sick than the neurotic person from the standpoint of the realization of their aims as human beings, right? As beings, they're nowhere, they're retarded, existentially naked. Jung says it is a notorious fact that the morality of the society as a whole is an inverse ratio to its size. For the greater the aggregation of individuals, the more the individual factors are blotted out, and with them the morality, which rests entirely on the moral sense of the individual and the freedom necessary for this. He's talking about virtue and morality being yours. Forget what the society believes. But in the solution section, we're going to come back to that. Hence, every man is, in a certain sense, unconsciously a worse man when he's in society or in a group than when acting alone. For he is carried by that society, and to that extent relieved of his individual responsibility. Any large company composed of wholly admirable persons has the morality and intelligence of an unwieldy, stupid, and violent animal. The bigger the organization, the more unavoidable is its morality and blind stupidity. Freud used to say, I'd wake up in panics and hot sweat every night in Vienna, listening to the clutter of the hooves of the engines of war going off to another Austrian war. That man is not learning. He's trying to heal people, get them out of the mess, and he's hearing the engines go, again, another one, another one, another one, the First World War, the Second World War. Cold sweats. What the hell is going on? Are we going backwards? Are we going forwards? Why does Pat man not get it? Here we are again. How further on? The same thing again and again and again. <laughs> Society is divided, says Fromm, into two groups of those seeking to break the mental and emotional coding and actualize selfhood, and those seeking only to conform and sacrifice their identity to the many ideologies, lifestyles, and cults that proliferate, and which are designed to erase personal identity. Right? And they're trying to, each one trying to avoid the, the anxiety that comes with it. The man who's resisting the world is an anxiety because he's self, his self is saying, no, I am not a number. Yes or no, Mr. Rourke. Take the contract or not. No. And the other creature who's escaping his self is, you're like, sure, don't even have to pay me. We're all the brothers together. Sure, I'll work for you. Any man's work as everybody else's. Those who conform, who remain within the relative comfort zone, who never aspire to, toward independence of thought or action, who never, and who even suppress those who do. That's the next step, isn't it? You've, you've done a good job of suppressing yourself. Self-murder. Hey, what's next on the menu? Suppress everybody else. Who deeply hate themselves for their love of falseness, the shame and the guilt. Guilt is over an individual misdemeanor that or felony you do to somebody. You know? And then an individual action that's immoral or something that you feel bad about. Guilt. Shame is what you did to yourself as a life. Shame is what you've made of your own life. Two very different things. Again, look at the words we use, or misinterpreted they being they're interchangeable and they're not. Now this hatred, or are you saying self-hatred? must at times be vicariously processed. Oh, wait till we get to the second vampirism. This hatred, he says, must at times be vicariously processed. This is achieved in a myriad fascinating ways. You bet it is. <clears throat> One of which is sadism towards others. The most severe manifestation of such violence is obviously war. The surrender of one's own self has often been praised as the example of the great love, as it will continue to be praised. It is actually a form of idolatry and also an annihilation of the self. The drive is also rooted in a deep anxiety and an inability to stand alone. But instead of finding increased strength by being swallowed, strength and security are found in having limited power over the other person. He means having power over the other person. The masochistic as well as the synthetic kind of love are expression of one basic need which springs from a basic inability to be independent. False love. I've said so many times. It's not anger, hatred, and violence that are the problem in this world. It is false love. If the other things have a problem, I'm not saying they're not problems, but they are subsidiaries of that. They're secondary to that. They're satellite to that. If you don't deal with the poison in the blood, nothing will go right. If you deal with the main problem in the blood, all the other little 
peccadilloes and problems heal of their own accord once you've dealt with the poison that's in the blood. Fix that and everything else fixes itself of its own accord. But you trying to go out and run, you know, put out the fires, move the furniture around in the Titanic is not going to work. Arnold Grun says in Betrayal of the Self, a distorted development of autonomy is the root cause of the pathological and ultimately evil element in human beings. The roots of evil. I told you, ten years on, man will discover what this thing is in all of its permutations, all of its forms. Freud. You know, it's, philosophy is all about certainty, as life is. But the problem is we don't accept the certainty. We can't. Our whole minds resist the certainty, like the light. We can't take it. Look how, how you are going to cringe when I finish this sentence. The more love I turn towards the outside world, the less love I have for myself, and vice versa. Freud is thus moved to describe the phenomenon of falling in love as an impoverishment of one's self-love because all love is turned to an object outside oneself. What we call falling in love is the first level of enslavement. Your enslavement and their enslavement. Hers and mine. Me to her and you to me, and we call it love. Five minutes later, it's in ruins. Five, late, five minutes later, our kids are turning the world into trash. Decay is all around us in society under this name. There is one thing missing, freedom. Because to me, freedom and love are the same word. I'm empty, I need you. You're empty, you need me. And we agree. The Rourke does not agree. The Rourke says, sorry, I am not going to be dependent on you. I love you and I share the virtues with you, uh, the values of you. I have care towards you, and as long as you continue to have the same value to me, I value you. And if you share my values, we are together, we have a relationship. But my love does not mean that I'm dependent on you, nor can I not be vigilant to stop you becoming dependent on me. Remember, no, slave up, no master above, no slave below. Side words and relationships, it means, I'm not dependent on you. Not, not emotionally, not psychologically. And I also, because I really love you, stop you from becoming dependent on me. If there's going to be a relationship, that's the all you're going to have. That, that's it. And that's what you don't see in this world. We see all the fallout, though, under the name of the, of the false love. Ayn Rand says, in popular usage, the word selfishness is a synonym synonym of evil. The image it conjures is of a murderous brute who tramples over piles of corpses to achieve his own ends, who cares nothing for no living being and pursues nothing but the gratification of the mindless whims of the immediate moment. Yet the exact meaning and dictionary definition of the word selfishness is simply concern with one's own interests. And you could be my interest. You could be my value. It's not a sacrifice then. I'm not losing something of myself because I value you. Unless I'm an idiot and value you when you're garbage, you're rubbish. That's again, you know, then you're not rational, are you? But if you're worthy of my valuing you and I know how to give that value, okay, we, we, we've got something. Now the collectivist imagines that anything he does, you see, or is about to do, or have even an opinion on, is everybody's property. That's what collectivism really means when you unpack it. It means that, look, pal, everything you do, everything you think, everything you sort of imagine, and it, yeah, certainly everything you create, you know, it's my property. They might try to do it this way by saying, everything I've got is your property. See, it sounds better, but it's no less deceptive. Hey, I'm an altruist, I'm a Gandhi. I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, like a, a, a non-profit foundation, I'm whoever, the World Bank or some philanthropic group, I'm, I'm Rockefeller. I give up on my stuff to you. Aren't I great? Watch out when you reach out, because it could be a co covered way of, of saying everything you own as well, the contract is. Everything you think now becomes my property. That's what the collectivists are all about. Ayn Rand says that a society that robs an individual of the product of his efforts, or enslaves him, or attempts to limit his freedom of his mind, or compels him to act against his own rational judgment, a society that seeks a society that sets up a conflict between its edicts and the requirement of the man's nature is not, strictly speaking, a society, but a mob held together by an institutionalized gang rule. Just to be clear on the point. 
Professor Charles Osgood of Stuart University, uh, Stuart uh, Umblebee, they say that in the organization of a civilization of the future, we anticipate that the individualistically oriented man will become an anachronism. Indeed, he will be viewed as a threat to the group organization as well as to his fellow men. Hence, as stated, in all likelihood, we'll have few individual expectations. While such a picture may not be pleasant to contemplate, we would be amiss to deal with unrealistic Im imageries of what that would blind us to the future reality. This is from a paper, by the way, called Mankind 2000, written by these globalists, to tell you what's on its way, to get you ready for it. Bertrand Russell, another high priest of this concept, said that diet, injections, and injunctions will be combined from a very early age to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable. And any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. You won't need the staff because you'll be remote controlled. You'll be mesmerized under the hex, the perfect slave, hail the providers. Eric Fromm says that it is the feeling of isolation of being shut out, which is the painful sting of every neurosis. Right? He's talking about the anxiety of not belonging. Remember the first kind? Where I'm not belonging causes me to be neurotic. I just need everybody's approval, and if I don't get it, will I lose control? He says, even the most irrational orientation, if it is shared by a considerable body of men, gives the individual the feeling of oneness with others. A certain amount of security and stability which the neurotic person lacks. There's nothing in human, evil, or irrational which is, does not give some comfort, provided it is shared by a group. So, again, we, we have to look at this in ourselves. It's useless unless we observe this in ourselves. <clears throat> it's a form of parasitism. How much of the, does the welfare and behavior of other people really preoccupy your mind? So again, there's a, as we said, is there a, a true self, an imperial self, as I call it, behind the social persona, this contrivance, this chameleon? How much of us is in fact programmed by this world?